Today I'll be teaching the game 1846, The Race for the Midwest. This is a game that was designed by Tom Lehman. It originally was published by a company called Deep Thought Games, but recently it was reissued in a new edition by GMT Games. And this is episode three of five. And then I want to give you a, a little bit of information about exceptions to the rule that every track tile that you lay costs $20. There are uh, water and mountain hexes on this board and water and mountain hex sides on this board. You see the mountains are brown and their points are upward like mountains are supposed to be. Uh, the rivers, uh, they're blue and they're flat on the top like rivers are supposed to be. So even if you're a little bit colorblind, you should be able to tell the mountains from the rivers. If you lay a tile in a hex with a number in it, instead of $20, you must pay that number. So in order to play a tile here, you must pay $40. Notice that Detroit has water in the middle of it. To play in Detroit, you must pay $40, and not $20 to play that tile. But then we have to look at hex sides. Uh, there's a charge for laying track in such a way that you connect track across the hex side. So if when the New York Central, in my example, decided to upgrade Detroit, it had played this tile, then it would have paid $40 for it. But that tile wasn't as useful as the one going to Windsor. In order to play track to Windsor, because there's track over here, if it lays this tile, then we have track on both sides, it would have to pay a $60 connection fee uh, to cross here, basically to build the tunnel under the river. So to lay this tile would cost $40 for the tile plus $60 for the connection. It would be a total of $100 to play this, as opposed to only $40 if it played the K tile. Other example might be if you look at Wheeling, where the B and O starts, if it wanted to play its starting in green, Starting in yellow, if it wanted to start in green, it would have to lay this tile, and this tile would cost 20 plus 20 for connecting across this hex side. Notice that it would not at this point have to pay either of these hex side costs uh, because there's no track connecting. However, let's imagine that it wanted to now lay a plain track tile here. This tile would cost $40 plus $20 more for the connection, or $60. So those are um, some of the, um, the, the, the terrain. There's another exception that you'll see on the board. You'll see a number of hexes here labeled $0 Illinois Central. As I mentioned, the state of Illinois uh, started the Illinois Central Railroad. They funded it. Uh, and part of the funding was that they gave them some free land to connect, kind of compete with those eastern railroads. And so if the Illinois Central lays a yellow tile in any of these hexes, uh, it doesn't have to pay. That's the only case in which you might not have to pay. So at the beginning of the game, for example, the Illinois Central could lay that and that both in the zero dollar and it would not have to pay anything for those tiles. If it upgrades one of them, then it has to pay. It's only the initial yellow uh, that it gets a discount on. If another company lays a yellow tile in this hex, um, then it does not get a discount. Only the Illinois Central gets that discount. Now, I described routes for trains with single numbers on them, but we also have slash trains, the 3 slash 5, the 4 slash 6, and the 7 slash 8. And these are trains um, that can be bought as an alternative in the phase 2, 3, and 4. I'll point out that if I turn over a 3, 5, I get a 4, and vice versa. So these trains can be bought in either configuration. You'll also notice the prices are different. A 4 train is going to cost $180, and a 3-5 train is going to cost $160. We haven't talked about buying trains, but the prices are different. A 3-5 slash five train runs a route up to five cities or offboards long, but only scores three of them. So imagine that we had taken the cheap upgrade here, and imagine that we had built track like this. The New York Central might want to run east-west, but the east-west route would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It could not run that with a 4 train. However, a 3, 5 train could run this route, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but it would only get to score 3 of the spaces. 
and it doesn't have free choice either, one of the spaces it scores must be a space where it has a station in. In this case, Detroit, that's not a bad choice. But if you want the east-west bonus, you must also score both ends. So with a 3-5 train running from Sarnia to Chicago Connections, if it wants the east-west bonus, bonus, it would have to score Sarnia, Chicago Connections, and Detroit. So that would be 3 and 5 and 2 is 10, plus 70 would be 170. Um, you may uh, say, well, that's not as good as the one that went uh, directly east-west, but it was cheaper to run. If I had had the, the east-west run like this, but I only had a 3-5 train, maybe I couldn't afford the 4 train, it would go 1, 2, 3, 4, it would have that route, it could score 3, it could score this one, this one, and that one. And that would be 4 and 5 is 9, and 2 is 11, plus 8 is 190. So those e flash trains uh, have two advantages. One is uh, that they're, um, in two of the cases, cheaper. But the other is they may allow you to reach east-west or reach a place that you want to get to that you couldn't have reached with the other train. As I mentioned, the company that runs routes with multiple trains uh, must use different track for each one, but it can reuse the locations. And you add up the revenue for each train. In the example we had with the New York Central, it managed to score Erie four times uh, because each one was a different track. After you've figured out what your revenue is, then you decide what to do with it. After all, the reason that you're running trains to earn revenue is uh, to make yourself richer. So the first thing that you can do is that you can pay out the earnings uh, to the people who own stock in the company. Uh, all the revenue amounts are divisible by 10. So if we divide the revenue that the company earns 10 ways, we will have uh, a number. For example, a company the New York Central here running east-west for $230, divided 10 ways, that would be $23 a share. And uh, we would pay uh, each player their share of that. So a player that had one share of the Illinois Central would earn $23 paid by the bank uh, to the player. If you own two shares, it would be $46 and so forth. Not all the shares are always owned by the players. If the Illinois Central has shares left in the treasury, let's say it has four shares left in the treasury, um, the earnings for those shares would go to the treasury. So $23 a share times four shares would be $92 into the treasury, which could be used later for building more track or laying more stations. If you have shares in the stock market, that money is retained by the bank because we would presume that they're owned by other investors that are not the players and this, uh, the money has to go to them uh, for their earnings. So another thing that you can do with your revenue, um, you may be feeling that uh, you need some more money in the treasury, and so you can withhold the money. Instead of paying that $230 out to the, to the shareholders, you could say, I'm going to withhold the money, and I'm going to put all $230 into my treasury uh, to add to the money. Maybe I need to buy a new train or lay a station or whatever I need to do. Uh, that's your second option. It's the president that makes that decision. Uh, the president, after all, owns the most stock in the company, and, uh, or is tied for the most, and therefore has the biggest stake in it. But uh, the president then can say, um, I'm not going to pay out dividends. I'm going to withhold it, leave it in Treasury. Uh, the other shareholders, um, they have nothing to say about that. What the president cannot do is the president cannot pay dividends to the president shares and fail to pay dividends to the other shares. You must either pay out or withhold uh, for all the shares equally. Another thing that the company can do is that it can half pay. So it can pay half of the money out to the shareholders and put the other half into the treasury. So if the company earned $180, it could put $90 into the treasury and it could pay $9 a share out to stockholders. If it did that for the Illinois Central with four shares in treasury, it would get $90 for the half that stayed in Treasury, and it would get another $36 for the four shares that earned $9 a share. So you'd get $126 into the Treasury. Now, we had the example of a company making $230. Uh, if you divide that in half, uh, you get $11.5 a share, uh, which is not workable here. Uh, whenever you have an odd amount per share, you always round up in favor of the stockholders. So if the company earned $230 and decided to half pay, it would pay $12 a share or $120 to the stockholders, 
and $110 would go into Treasury. So in this case, if the Illinois Central ran for $230 and half paid, it would get $110 plus 4 times 12 is 48. It would get $158 uh, into the Treasury. Those are the three choices that the president has, and this is another of the important choices in the game, is uh, how much do you pay out? Do you pay it all out? Do you pay half of it out, or do you retain it? At different times, uh, you need to do two different things. After you uh, earn and distribute or fail to distribute uh, your, uh, your income, we then adjust the stock price. Because a company that's paying out dividends, its stock price is going to go up. There's a little chart here on the board that describes what happens, and there are five possibilities. If the company pays less than half of the current price in dividends, so if um, the Illinois Central's price is 70, and let's imagine that it has only one two train, and this is the track that it has run. Well, it does have a route from Cairo to Centralia, but that route's revenue would be only $30. That's less than half of 70 and so the price would go down. We would move the price down. We typically demonstrate that by turning the marker over to indicate that company is run, so you don't try to run the same company twice. If the company pays at least half but less than the current price, so imagine the Illinois Central paid $40 a share, it would stay where it is. It wouldn't even go to the bottom of this box. It would still be in the spot. It would stay where it is. If the Illinois Central played at least its current price, so let's imagine that it paid $70, $80, $90, it would go up one box to a higher price. The stockholders see it paying out dividends, and they uh, bid the price up. If it pays at least twice its current price, it would go up two boxes. So if the Illinois Central paid at least $14 a share, or $140 in dividends, it would go up two boxes. Note that this is the amount that goes to the stockholders. If you retain or half pay, retaining means you paid nothing to stockholders, your price will go down. If you half pay, the question is how much a share did you pay to the stockholders? And finally, there's one final possibility, but that possibility is only possible once you've gotten past this goldenrod box. And you can see written here in goldenrod, 3x possible. If the stock is here and you pay out at least three times the stock price, three times 165 is 495, so you'd have to pay at least $500 or $50 a share to stockholders, you get to go up three times. However, if you were here and you paid $23 a share, 230 is three times 70, but while you're still in this goldenrod box or below it, you can do no more than go up two spaces. And as I mentioned, you take this marker, you flip it over, we can see by the color on the back that it's the Illinois Central, and we know that the Illinois Central has run. If the company has no train, it's going to have no revenue. And if it has no revenue, its price will go down. It doesn't matter if you have the excuse that you have no train. A company that pays no revenue, its price will go down. One of the consequences of this is that in the very first operating round of the game, when none of the companies yet owns a train, uh, all of their prices are going to go down one box. Okay. And so you watch this and you see uh, what's there. I'll point out that just below this, it has some information about the stock round. I mentioned this to you already, but if the stock market has shares of the company, it goes one step left at the end of the stock round. If stock is 100% held by players, it goes one step to the right. I will point out that this box describes things that happen during an operating round, whereas this box describes things that happen at the end of a stock round. Okay, so we've talked about some of the steps in the operating round. First, the company can issue or redeem shares. Then it can lay track and or place stations. And then it runs its trains for the revenue. It either pays the revenue out, it doesn't pay it out, it half pays, and we adjust the stock price. And then it come, becomes time to buy trains. Uh, every corporation must have a train at the end of its operating round. And so if you do not own a train, the corporation must buy a train. If the corporation already has a train, then it may buy a train uh, subject to the rules. The trains are bought from the bank in color order. So first you buy the phase one trains, the yellow ones. When they're all gone, you buy the phase two trains. Uh, when they're all gone, you buy the phase three trains, and when they're all gone, you buy the phase four trains. You cannot skip ahead. 
You may also buy trains uh, from another corporation as long as the presidents of both corporations agree. That's a different sort of process. It's often easier uh, to get the presidents to agree if you're the president of both corporations. It's possible to buy a train from a corporation owned by another president, but it's less common. The bank sells trains at list price. So the two trains cost 80. The green trains cost either 160 or 180, depending on which kind you buy. The brown trains cost either 500 or 450. And the gray trains cost either 800 or 900. In the gray train case, um, the slash train is unequivocally be more valuable than the six train, and it costs only $100 more. Unfortunately, sometimes you don't have that $100, and you're better off settling for the six train. Um, so the corporation, at the end of uh, paying out revenue adjusting the stock price, can buy trains from the bank or trains from other corporations. When you buy a train from another corporation, you do not have to pay list price. You may pay any agreed upon price between the two presidents of $1 or more. So in particular, you could buy a train across for $1,000 or $1,500 uh, if the purchasing company had the money as long as the two presidents agree. And sometimes this can be a valuable tactic. Now there is a train limit in the game. And if you look here on the charter, uh, you will see a little chart of phases. And right next to the phase, it shows the train limit. So phase one, it shows a train limit of four. Uh, at the beginning of the game, a company may own up to four trains. Uh, phase two, it also says four. But when phase three starts, the train limit drops to three. And when phase four starts, the train limit drops to two. Uh, this means that's the maximum number of trains that you may own. So in particular, if you already own uh, the number of trains equal to the train limit, you may not buy another train. We call that being train tight. Even if the new train that you might buy uh, would reduce the number of trains, we're going to talk about that, you cannot buy a train if you're at your train limit. A corporation that finds itself with more trains than the train limit uh, must immediately uh, return some of them to the bank uh, where they would be available for purchase as an alternate to a new train from the bank or from another corporation. This is fairly rare, but it can happen. Now, we got to talk about game phases in conjunction with buying trains. Remember, I talked about the phases, one, two, three, and four, and how a uh, new track becomes available when we get to a new phase. And uh, the thing that drives the phases is the purchase of trains. So we begin the game in phase one. As soon as not only all of the yellow trains have been bought, but some corporation purchases a green train, Immediately, we move to phase two. When phase two happens, you will see, you will see um, here that the train limit is still four, and green track is available. That's what this green means. When phase three happens, that is when the brown train is bought. When the brown train is bought, more things happen. One is that we phase out phase one trains. What this means is once a brown train is bought, phase one trains are on their way out. They do not die immediately, but what we do is we turn them sideways to indicate that they're phasing out. That means that they have at most one more operating round to run. If uh, the company has these phased out trains, uh, they can run in that future operating round, but a few rules. One is a company cannot buy a phased out train. So I mentioned that you can buy a train from another company, but not a train that's phased out. But the second thing is that phased out trains do not count towards a company's train limit. So if we imagine that the New York Central somehow had bought four phase one trains, and that's its train limit, and now someone um, purchases a phase three train, these would all phase out. Uh, however, uh, the New York Central could purchase another train because its train count would now be down to zero for the purposes of the train limit. So that is phased out trains. Another thing that happens in phase three is we remove the private companies from the game. I haven't described private companies, but we remove them from the game. The train limit goes down to three Brown track is available, 
And one more thing, remember we talked about these offboards that have different values in yellow and in brown. In phases one and two, you use the yellow value. In phase three and four, you use this brown value, which is in most cases more than the yellow value. The one exception is Holland, Michigan, which is worth 40 early in the game. It was an important shipping port, but once the railroads got going, Holland lost its economic prominence and goes down to 10. Uh, the others all go up. That's what happens when a brown train is bought. When a gray train is bought, we also have phasing out, but we also have remove phase one trains. So remember I said that when the brown train is bought, the yellow trains phase out. If a gray train is bought before those yellow trains get their one more run, uh, then these are just removed from the game without a chance to get another run. The gray train also phases out the green trains, which get one more run. It removes private company markers. We'll talk about the private company markers. The private companies go away in phase three, but the private company markers don't go away until phase four, and the train limit goes down to two. It's important to talk about this phase uh, progression, and in particular the ability to phase out uh, trains as an important concept in this game. And that is because uh, one reason you might buy a brown train is to earn more revenue for your company, but another reason you might buy a brown train is to phase out the yellow trains that your competitors are running. And uh, if your competitors are not prepared, uh, the need to purchase an expensive train may come as a surprise to them. So um, it shouldn't be too much a surprise, and in most cases they get another run with the train while it's phased out, but if you imagine that you're playing a game in which your competitors' corporations have more yellow trains than you do, uh, they're going to get an advantage, and you could stop that by buying a brown train and getting rid of their yellow trains. The other thing that I will say is I mentioned that at the end of a company corporation's turn, it must own a, a train. A phased out train does not count for that purpose. So a corporation at the end of its turn must own a non-phased out train. If the corporation must own a train, but it can't afford to buy one from the bank, and it cannot negotiate a purchase with another corporation, um, it must buy one with the bank, from the bank, and the president of the corporation must chip in the money that is necessary to enable that corporation to afford a train. Up until now, being the president has been all a good thing, but uh, when the company needs a train and can't afford one, the president is the one on the hook uh, to buy the train. So imagine, for example, that it was time to buy a brown train and your corporation only had $400. Then it could not afford one of these brown trains, and if it did not already have a green train, any yellow trains it had would be phased out and not count, then the president would have to help it buy a train. When that situation occurs, uh, the president can decide either to buy uh, the more expensive train or the less expensive train, and the president takes money out of his or her own cash and adds it to the corporation to make just enough to buy the train that the corporation wants to buy, and then the corporation buys the train. After this process, the corporation will have no money left because the president is only allowed to contribute the minimum amount to allow that corporation to buy a train. If the president doesn't have enough cash, then the president must sell stock in order to allow uh, him or her to contribute the money. And in extreme cases, the president may not be able to raise that amount of money and go bankrupt. I am not going to describe the bankruptcy rules in this game. Uh, unless people are doing crazy things, uh, bankruptcies only occur in 1% to 2% of 1846 games. And I suggest that you learn the game, and if you need to do a bankruptcy, look it up rather than me cramming your head with uh, bankruptcy rules. However, um, president paying money to buy a train often does happen. So you have to realize that if your company needs a train and can't afford one, uh, the president must chip in. I will say that um, the corporation will often issue shares to stock market at the beginning of its turn uh, in this situation as a better alternative to the president have to chip in. However, um, there is a rule about issuing shares, and the rule about issuing shares is that um, the corporation cannot issue shares in such a way that after issuing shares, there are more shares in the stock market than, company, than the players own. So imagine that the Illinois Central has two shares with the president, two shares with another player, 
two shares in the stock market, and four shares still in Treasury. The players only uh, own four shares, so in issuing shares, the corporation could only issue two shares, making the number in the stock market the same as the number owned by players. So this could provide a limitation on the corporation's ability to issue shares. Uh, another problem might be that players own all of the shares and the corporation has none to issue. So I've explained how the stock round works. I've explained how the operating rounds work. You always run two operating rounds after a stock round. And then if the game is not over, you go on to another stock round and you repeat the process. The game can end in two ways. Uh, one way is that uh, during the course of the stock round or the operating rounds, uh, you used up all of the money in the bank. If you buy the GMT version, it comes with paper money adding up to $12,000. Uh, many players use poker chips if they play a lot of 18xx, but either way, um, the bank uh, only starts with a certain amount of money. Here I'm going to show you in this chart with three players, the bank starts with 6500 With four, it starts with 7500 and with five, it starts with 9000 as I said, the game comes with 12,000, so you must remove at the beginning of the game an amount of money from the bank in 500s, presumably, uh, to get down to this amount. As soon as this amount of money is used up, uh, you know that the game is going to end when you get to the end of operating round two the next time. At that point, you take the extra money that you put away and you add it to allow you to continue to do transactions, but the game ends. So that's one way the game ends is that you run out of money in the bank either during a stock round or one of the operating rounds. In any case, you play through to the end of operating round two and you end the game. Uh, the other way the game can end is that all the players except one go bankrupt. Uh, this is very rare. As I mentioned, even one player going bankrupt is very rare. But hypothetically, if you're playing the game and all of your opponents go bankrupt, you don't have to sit there and play the game out by yourself uh, until you break the bank. Uh, in fact, maybe you were going to go bankrupt too, but you're, you're free. You, 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 you made it out. At the end of the game, players add up uh, what they're worth. At the end of the game, typically the stock price markers are going to be up here because you've been paying out dividends and you've been earning money. And each share of stock you own is worth whatever that money is. And uh, usually you get out a piece of paper. Some people use computer spreadsheets, but you write down uh, each share of New York Central is worth $320. Uh, if a player owns three shares of New York Central, that's $960. You just make a little tabulation. Pennsylvania, 295 Illinois Central, 250 That's the first thing, the value of your stock. If you own a president's share, that's two shares. So the president's share of the Illinois Central, if the Illinois Central stock price is 250 that president's share would be worth $500. Second thing you add is you add your cash, the player cash. You do not add cash in the company. That's the company's assets. Your value for the company is the stock value, not the money in treasury. And finally, again, this is very rare, but if the game were to end while the private companies were still in play because nobody ever bought a brown train, and if some of those private companies were owned by players, then the face value of those private companies would also uh, contribute to your net worth. The player with the most net worth would win. Typically, uh, the scores in this game would be thousands of dollars. So it's highly unlikely that there will be a tie. But if there's a tie, it's just a tie. And you can tell stories about it to people about how you tied with $6,751 each. Uh, pretty rare. I've never been in a tie myself. This is episode three of five.